Huh, pretty sword. Because of scheduling conflicts, I was going to meet up at the friend's house several hours beforehand to do a session zero with another player before they had to go to work. I was okay with this, but I had to wake up earlier than usual to get it done. I work late nights, so early afternoon is basically early morning for me. So we plan to meet up at 2.45pm today and get everything done before she goes to work. This is where it went bad almost immediately. I arrived around 10 minutes late, having woke up not even an hour before. This was just unacceptable. The problem player refused to talk to me or my friend because I was 10 minutes late. I felt bad, but we still had plenty of time to go over things before she had to go to work. Turns out I was just outside her time frame, and she needed to watch Eurovision live with a long-distance friend from Twitch, as that was way more important. I said we could shorten it only a few minutes, and I can just cover everything like really fast. But she refused to even come to the table where I had all of my DM stuff laid out. She offered to have us move into her room so she could watch Eurovision, but with the volume down, while I tried to explain my whole homebrew setting I've been planning out for months. My friend started arguing with her, and it got heated fast. It eventually boiled down to her saying that she doesn't even care about my campaign, that's just Dungeons & Dragons, and she never even wanted to play in the first place. You know, scheduling is the bane of every D&D game, but 10 minutes? Really? And all for Eurovision? I get that D&D can't always be a priority, but come on, having a freak out over Eurovision and 10 minutes of missed time isn't really worth it, is it? About a year back, I needed a break from DMing my own game and decided to look around for some of the pay-to-play games across a few different sites I frequented. One was a DM with a lot of experience that was starting a new campaign after his previous one fell apart due to scheduling. I paid my fee, joined in with him and a few of his friends who were also paying, and his wife. Session Zero was free as he laid the groundwork for the campaign, explained homebrew rules, homebrew setting, and laid out what the world was like. I went with a tiefling bard after being warned that tieflings are a kill on sight type of species because they are actual demons that escaped hell. I knew the risks and what would come of it if I was caught, and the party may also join in killing me. Session 1, we are shipwrecked on an island, and it's pretty standard stuff. We get the band together to survive, with my character wrapped up in baggy clothes, goggles, and a thick turban to hide most of his skin and defining features, and deceptions his way past any attempt to find out about his heritage. All except for the DM's wife, who says she knows what he is, despite failing her insight role three separate times, and starts trying to expose me. I continue to evade her, and soon she goes to full-on trying to grapple me. It is worth noting that the DM's wife is playing a one-armed artificer, who hasn't learned how to make a prosthetic yet, and she fails every attempted at grapple against me because they are at disadvantage, and my dex is high to keep my stealth and sleight of hand high too. I tell a story about how it's against my religion to show my face outside of home. The rest of the party buys it and stops her from continuing to try and disrobe me. We make camp with the few survivors of the shipwreck we were in and volunteer to find a safer place for camp, as well as looking for what caused this magical storm. A bit of time, we locate a cave and clear it of the monsters inside to move the survivors to. Moving in deeper, we start to encounter undead guardians of some lost civilization. We beat them, and the DM's wife finds a magical ring that lets her learn a stored memory from the ring. She uses it to solve a puzzle we encounter in the next room, then demands that she be the one to keep it. No one really argues with her, and we move on. Once we get deep enough into the cave, we encounter a storm creature that was left behind to protect this lost civilization. I try to talk to the creature and persuade it to end its task, but it merely gets it to go easier on us when the fight eventually breaks out. We beat it with a bit of struggle, and I notice it drops an orb of some kind. I pick it up, and the DM's wife demands that she gets to keep this too. I tell her that she got to keep the last thing, and I tell her I will be holding it for the group to use after I attune to it first. She starts getting ready to cast a spell on me, and the rest of the party that I have been healing and keeping safe tell her it's one thing to argue, and another thing to jump to attacking someone. She relents, and with the storm creature defeated, we stop the magical storm and are able to contact a passing ship for aid. 
on this new ship on our way to the next port, things start to come to a head. I attune to the orb and it turns out to be a homebrew orb of weather control that resets at dawn. I use it once to put the wind into our sails and inform the group of what it does. No one really wants it for themselves and they trust it to me. Well, no one, I say, but the DM's wife, who demands that I hand it over to her because my kind shouldn't be trusted with magical artifacts. I simply tell her I won't give it to her until she starts acting polite to me, and once again, she threatens violence, and once again, the rest of the group defends me. She later tries to steal it from me, twice, and I don't relent, but I do offer an alternative. She wants this orb so badly, she will have to trade for it. She gets the orb for one day, and in that time, I get the memory storing ring she took for that time. She gets a legendary magic item, and I get a common item. Seemingly a bad deal. She spends the day studying its magic and eventually learns its origin, but not how it was made or how to make it herself. I spend my time on a prank we will get back to later. When it comes time to trade back the ring, I give it, and she starts taunting me and saying that she has no plans to return the orb to my kind. I shrug and tell her it's her loss and walk away. When I'm away, she notices the ring has a memory stored in it, and of course, she jumps at the chance to use it as blackmail against me, so she uses the ring to see it. What she watches in the memory is me in a mirror, transforming to look exactly like her via disguised self, and going around with my bardic charm, flirting with all the sailors on the ship. I don't perform or promise any acts, I just flirt and flutter my eyelashes and make myself a general nuisance and distraction to the sailors. Of course, she comes chasing after me and the other party members have to stop her from killing me. I tell her that she has that much anger about a simple prank to just perform a prank of her own against me. I'm still thinking this anger is in character at this point, of course. She decides she does want to prank me in return, and of course she escalates to the nth degree by trying to permanently mute my character by pouring acid in my mouth, as well as blinding me by putting in my eyes while I sleep. She fails her stealth roll, however, and I catch her in the act of what seems like attempted murder. I try to run, and she starts casting harming spells on me. I do, however, raise the alarm, and this results in her being put in the brig for the remainder of the trip at sea. We do make it to land, however, and I am ready to simply leave the party and say my own farewells, but one member states that it's safer for us to work in a group and we could really make some money if we stick together. I decide to put it on a trial run and join them, most of it just being roleplay dialogue. DM's wife is vehemently against me joining them and tells them that she would continue to try and kill me if I did join. The rest of the group says that she shouldn't threaten people like that and tell her that she doesn't have to join them if she doesn't want to. At about this point, I start to feel bad about how things are going between our characters and send her a message. It's along the lines of, Hey, I hope you know that any rudeness from my character is just roleplay. I think you're great and your character is awesome and blah, 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 blah. Basically trying to make sure that what's going on between our characters is in character and not her hating me for whatever reason. The message ends up being left on red, however. After one more session where the DM's wife kills two random NPCs because they didn't give her exactly what she wanted when she wanted it, she ends up screaming at the DM and storming out of the game. DM understandably ends the game for that night. I got a message from said DM later that day saying how he thinks I'm really cool and how he would love to play with me again. But he can't have me in the game anymore because his wife threatened to end the game if he didn't. I was kind of shocked by this and really didn't know how to respond. Apparently, I learned this later from friends of the DM that we played with, this was the second time she did this and they ended up leaving the game after that. She will apparently throw tantrums about the game and go without talking to her husband for days if he does something she doesn't like. The rest of the players also half the time side with me not because I had good arguments but either just to make her mad or just to snub her. Understandably, I decide not to rejoin that whole group for any activities down the line. Oh my god, this is something that people are paying for. It's interesting because usually when we see romantic partner favoring, it's in-game stuff the DM gives them. But here, it's not in-game stuff. The DM's wife suffers realistic consequences for her actions, such as trying to acid someone's mouth, for instance. But this DM is not absolved because he is doing something worse. He's giving his wife out-of-game favoritism, an out-of-game power trip. If she doesn't like you, she has full power to make your time in the game bad and to get you kicked out of the game on top of that. Now, I want to clarify, I think it's perfectly possible for romantic partners to play games together. 
People have gone to the comments and say, I think it's impossible for anyone in a relationship to play Dungeons and Dragons. And frankly, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Of course it's possible. It's just some people don't try very hard to make it work. In fact, this DM and his wife are making it worse by charging people for this wife power trip experience. That right there is greedy dumbassery of monumental proportions. <laughs> I used to find games through an online role-playing group on Facebook. After various random pickup games, usually DMs would gather a group of players for real campaigns from the pool of people they've met in the group. There was a player, we will call him Bruce, that had a tendency to bring min-max characters to all the games, but he always came up with interesting character concepts and good roleplay. So eventually, I managed to get into a long-term campaign with Bruce, and this is where some of his flaws were made more apparent. When faced with long-term campaign play, flaws in his character concepts would sometimes drive other players at the table crazy. It's one thing to play the know-it-all in a one-shot, but when every other player's idea is shot down because his character thinks he knows best, it gets grating. Then you add to the other roleplay deadly sins, metagaming non-stop, min-maxing his build to the extreme, teleporting himself into other players' roleplay moments, it all adds up. It grew to a point where the in-character arguments were bleeding into out-of-character complaints to the DM, who quit running the game as a means of dealing with it. Flash forward to the future, occasionally I would run into Bruce doing one of those one-shots and his roleplay was more bearable in smaller quantities. A lot of that grating annoyance faded away. Bruce and I end up in another campaign together. I was apprehensive at first, but decided to give it a shot. People change, after all. It was great playing with him this time. He was playing a laid-back guy that was basically playing this wizard's bodyguard over the course of the game. They adopted a traumatized bard and had all these great roleplay moments. He was respectful and didn't talk over everyone because he was playing the guy that only stepped in when people were too afraid to. Redemption arc, we love to see it. So when the DM of that game talked about running another one for the same group of folks, everyone was super excited. Then came the character concept from hell. We have all the boxes ticked. Metagaming, refusing player buy-in, min-maxing, and main character syndrome. Bruce wanted to play an inquisitive rogue that was basically Batman, hence why I call him Bruce. He fought crime and was crafty and obsessed with combining magic with his rogue abilities. Metagaming first. First session when the bard in the party pickpocketed some slimy nobles during the big oh no plot hook to bring the party together, he demanded to know if he saw her do it because it would affect what he thought of her. Because crime is bad? Okay. This continues to such an extreme that when another player decided to kill some slavers after Bruce decided for the group that we were leaving them alive, he would constantly ask for insight checks for this player to try and figure out what they had done, to the point where he concocted a scheme where he was going to excuse his all criminals are bad motto to go and recruit these murdered guys to a spy network he was forming. He had to know they were dead. He had to know that another player was responsible for it. Refusing player buy-in. After the big first session plot hook where everyone is meant to come together as a party, he decides no. He splits from the group to go back to his apartment that he made the DM come up with on the fly and refused to stay with the party. He always had to be convinced of any plan or goal that wasn't driven by his character. Doesn't matter the occult enslaved and so and so. He didn't have a stake in the game until he finds out his backstory NPC was also enslaved by this cult. Oh, main character syndrome. In addition to refusing to group up with the party and being difficult with quest buy-in, he will constantly leave the group to pursue his own goal. See the aforementioned spy network and his missing NPC from his backstory. He refused to tell the group he was looking for someone and was basically riding the coattails of our investigation to go off on his own and follow up his own leads, leaving the DM to constantly balance the single player investigation that he was having to run for Bruce and the rest of the party trying to essentially waste time because the rest of the party didn't want to advance the story while there was a party member missing. Min maxing, here's the big one. Smaller issue was that he put all of his points into insight and would constantly use himself as a human lie detector against any NPC we encountered, even though we had a cleric with zone of truth. See, there's a conversation I kind of want to see. Foolish party members, I know that your low insight skills do not allow you to determine the truth of this matter, but I alone know, with a 23 insight roll, I have successfully determined what you idiots could not. Hey, dude, I no need to freak out. It's all good. What? Yeah, I'm casting Zone of Truth. What is that? Oh, it's this great spell. Let's me just tell if somebody's lying. It's awesome. Yeah, I can do it a few times, actually. Just let me finish praying. 
if he thought he beat out someone's role, which was all the time because he did the math that would require someone expertise in lying to contest his insight, he automatically trusted them, even though deception could be set as a DC. He thought he could insight a Rakshasa or an Archfey, which in my games, I would set that at DC 35, which even a nat 20, he couldn't beat that. Min maxing 2, Electric Boogaloo. Our DM was very generous with his magic items and often did not consider player balance when handling magic items or abilities. In one game, he handed a level 3 druid a staff of the woodlands, which is. insane. He trusts his players to keep themselves in check, though. Most of us did, Bruce did not. He received an item that basically gave him the ability to craft tokens that would store spells. There was nothing really limiting him as to what kind of spells he could put in there, as our group didn't have a wizard. The DM was okay with letting him have a fun toy to fill that in in the arcane gap. It was fine at first, silence, invisibility, normal mundane stuff, but then the DM approved a spell without considering the effects of balancing his encounters. Tensair's transformation. 50 temp hit points, advantage on attack, extra 2d12 damage on a hit, extra attack, partridges and pear trees, the whole shebang. On a level 11 rogue with 66 sneak attack combined with the grave cleric and her ability path to the grave, he was a monster on the battlefield. We killed a kraken in two rounds. That's the DM's fault, I'm sorry. The group talked to him about the metagaming and how it was unfair he was trying to dictate what his character would know about the other characters when he was keeping secrets from them. The fact that if he uses insight on someone, that meant that the party had to trust them, and it was an issue with his character if they didn't. There were several times he thought they were telling him the truth, but he was wrong, or the character didn't realize they were lying, and it got the party in serious trouble. He promised to do better, but it didn't stop, and after the third big encounter made trivial by his overpowered abilities, the group was at their wit's end. Not sure if he saw the writing on the wall, but he had personal issues come up that caused him to leave the game. We finished out the campaign as a three-person party and recruited a new player to our group and have been living happily ever after ever since. Now, like I said earlier, the min-maxing is mostly the DM's fault, I'm gonna be honest with you. At least that's how I see it. As a dungeon master who gives out plenty of magic items, I am aware that if I give my players something painfully overpowered, it's not their fault for deciding to use it. This DM should never have approved that blatantly overpowered spell, and should think about what magic items are appropriate to give to player characters. That's a basic tenet of rewarding your players. Yes, sometimes it can be difficult, but this seems way over the top overpowered for a D&D game. But at the same time, Bruce's metagaming, in my opinion, this is metagaming's worst form, when metagaming is used as an avenue to hurt other player characters. Metagaming PvP is just BS. PvP in general is something that is kinda iffy in D&D, it should be something done with consent from all players. Here, that's probably not the case. And on top of that, Bruce is just straight up cheating so he can win. That's not the goal of D&D, the goal is to work together, PvP should build a story for everyone everybody if you do it and that's not what bruce is doing here there's a ton of issues with this guy but yeah at least it worked itself out right so i've been playing in this campaign for a few months and recently my player character just died i'll give you a bit of backstory first well i drew up a bar to play in this campaign that was explained to me it would be DD without any major changes to the mechanics just some minor stuff, just some minor stuff to explain some races in his world. He did not let me decide on my backstory on my own, and made me a part of a faction that has an objective to destroy the monarchs ruling the land. So I went with it and started to get into my character, you know, getting more involved into this storyline, getting stuff for this faction and doing missions, taking intel from one place to another, etc. I was even allowed to create a kind of subdivision of this faction that, as an additional objective, want to not only overthrow the royal family, but to kill them. I spent a few sessions with me gathering people into this subdivision of the faction, and it seemed like it was finally going great. I was having some trouble keeping myself interested in the campaign because of some of the homebrew the DM imposed on us like three to two sessions ago. He ruled that you can only ever cast spells if you win an opposed intelligence check against the enemies. The thing is, I was playing a bard, so every single time I would lose the check and basically just have to twiddle my thumbs through the whole combat encounter and hope for one of our allies to be able to win the check so I could cast spells 
but with that player's permission. Another rule introduced was that we and the enemies had a bunch of reactions and apparently spell slots were not applicable anymore. Basically a very different premise than D&D &D without major mechanical changes, you know? We were basically playing an entirely different game. Also, every time I managed to win the intelligence check, only on like nat 20s, was when I casted spells that required a saving throw. And every single time, without fail, the enemy would pass that saving throw. So, back to the faction stuff, after a while, we get summoned to the throne room for a meeting with the king, so my character started to prepare himself to try and assassinate that king, because his whole story so far had revolved around ending his reign. When we got to the throne room, a fight broke out with some different enemies that invade the castle, and I decided to take my shot at the assassination. As soon as I tried to spell, the king passed the test and used two reactions to hit me twice, killing me. No, not, not downing me. He coughed my head, and I wasn't allowed death saves. I just had to roll a new character next session. That's rough, buddy. This guy was basically railroaded into an impossible objective, and the DM was kneecapping them the entire time. First and foremost, intelligence checks as a forced save whenever you're trying to cast spells is so dumb, because not every spellcaster is going to use intelligence, and therefore intelligence is not always going to be something that's feasible for them to succeed at. But I think this DM knew that. The conspiracy part of me has a sneaking suspicion the DM had it out for the bard, at least to some extent. I don't see another reason why all of this would be just pitted against them. I mean, the most notable thing here is that whole skill check thing, but also setting the objective to assassinate the king and making it so blatantly impossible with the king having two reactions that apparently just insta-kill you. Yeah, it sounds like the DM kind of just wanted to damn you from the start. Say it with me, people. Adversarial DMing is lame DMing. So this story is about how suppressed and non-reflected feelings can totally ruin D&D. In this story, the following take part. Myself, the DM, and a group of four long-term friends who are looking to play together. I'll simply call them by their character classes, Bard, Warlock, Fighter, and Rogue. They all seem like nice guys with some D&D experience, and I was starving to DM, so the game took off really nice. The campaign was set in my homebrew world, which actually means a lot to me, and I was ecstatic to show my new players the world and the plot I prepared specifically for them. Bard and Rogue decided to play two siblings, and during the game, they decided that both had a traumatic experience in their backstories, so they were kind of, uh, closer than siblings. They had, like, an attraction to each other. I said, okay, if that's what you want fine by me, and we continued playing. Their backstory, meanwhile, developed to the point where they decided that they even had, um... Anyway, it was fine by me. Usually I don't intervene in player character to player character relationships, with the exception being if it creates a conflict between players outside of game. Then, strange things started to happen. We had a chat where my players discussed the latest game, plot hooks, backstories, etc. And Bard was discussing only their ship with the rogue exclusively. They even stopped feedbacking me on the games. Instead saying something like, I'll write down my feelings in a few days. I just have too many emotions. And as you may guess, they never really did write. Eventually, I received a huge text in my DMs where Bard was complaining about how I was seeing their character only as a clown because I joked once about their character in the group chat. I said I was sorry and promised not to joke about their character anymore if it makes them uncomfortable. They mumbled something in response and the topic was closed. After about half a year of playing, I was called in Discord by Bard who started complaining about their character having too little spotlights and no side quests at all. Mind you, I gave Bard an item about five or so sessions earlier, which was clearly magical and Bard never even tried to inspect it. They just put it in their pocket and forgot. I reminded them about it, and Bard said something like, Yeah, but you don't give me time to inspect it. We always have something to do. I said they could do it any time they want, for example, during a long rest. I was really apologetic and somehow felt guilty about the whole situation. They also complained about how I was talking about everything in the group chat, but never about the Bard rogue ship, the sibling ship, and accused me of hating it. I was a bit shocked. I explained I don't intervene in PC-to-PC -PC relationships, and they responded with, well, you should then. 
I don't really remember much else from that talk, but it was extremely tiring and I felt like a bad DM after it. After about half a year of playing, I started noticing how every damn NPC who was friendly with Rogue or who Rogue was interested in got a cold shoulder from Bard. And when we started discussing a funny ship with Rogue and an NPC in the chat, Bard got livid and left the group returning back later when, as I discovered, they had a talking to from the Rogue. The more the merrier, the other players and I, except for Rogue, regularly got accused of saying slash joking that there was something wrong about Bard's character, so we actually stopped talking about them in general. But the last drop was when we were discussing characters and their charisma, not as a stat, and I said that I think that Rogue's characters were the most charismatic because Rogue themselves were a charismatic person. The next day, I got a huge message again from Bard, who somehow thought that the remark meant that I found them and their character not charismatic at all. Mind you, they had something like beauty in their backstory, so a lot of NPCs flirted with them. And then, Bard stated that if I can't say anything positive about their character, then I should stop discussing them in general. Like, just shut up and continue DMing me. I was so sick and tired of apologizing to Bard at this point that I said, Okay, look, if I'm such a bad DM for you, then why don't you stop being my player? Bard got livid and started crap messaging me with accusations again, but I simply, I simply blocked them. Ah, well, I mean, you know, a simple ending to, there's more, isn't there? Oh, if you think that's the end, you're deadly wrong. The worst part is about to come. It came out that Fighter and Warlock had received huge accusation texts in their messages too, about how they all misinterpret Bard's character and make them feel bad. I talked to them for a bit and they forwarded me messages with Bard complaining about how all the NPCs who Roe communicated with were part of my plan to separate the sibling <laughs> lovers because I hated their parent, and how these NPCs were all crappy, badly written, and nauseating. Also, Bard said that they talked to Rogue, and Rogue even wanted to forbid discussing any pairings, except Rogue and Bard in the chat. I immediately messaged Rogue, and they were as shocked as I was, saying that they and Bard never had that conversation. While talking to Rogue, I discovered that Bard always wanted to play with Rogue as their character's spouse, or lover, or at least close relative, and sometimes got aggressively jealous at anybody who tried to flirt, or just become close with Rogue in... Or out of character. You can guess the symptoms, right? Oh! They're, they're talking about the crush. I get it. I was so emotionally drained from all that drama that I had to take a huge hiatus in DMing. Three players still want to continue playing. There won't be any conclusions. Honestly, I just wanted to share this garbage. TLDR, player is jealous of their friend whom they secretly are in love with and gets aggressive over their character pairings. Yeah, even I can see that the bard is head over heels, a little bit too obsessed with the rogue. I know, I'm such a people person. The bard attempts to convince the group and the DM that the NPCs are a bunch of no good mean boys while they're the nice guy that no one understands. It's enough to make anyone want to leave a D&D group, and I think it's a miracle that any of these people wanted to stick around. The DM definitely had an inaction problem, but honestly, like we've said many, many times, we're often not equipped to handle these sort of situations. We play D&D to have fun, not deal with somebody's relationship problems. Especially when they are of the <clears throat> Targaryen variety. I think the OP's rule of not interfering with PC-to-PC -PC relationships unless there's a problem between the partners is a decent one, but it should be expected. Expanded. It should go to the entire group. Trauma relationships of this variety may make people extremely uncomfortable, so make sure the entire group is okay with that, because they matter too. Though of course, at the end of the day, this is the Bard's fault for initiating all this, and yeah. Glad the group at least figured that problem out. Alright, and that's it for today's episode of RPG Horror Stories. If you guys enjoyed them, please do leave a like. If you want to see more of our content, you can check out Tavern Adjacent, our D&D podcast. Puffin Force is coming onto the show this Wednesday, so you can binge to get hyped. And while you're there in the cards, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content when it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down in the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment, the DM's wife, to let me know you made it to the end of the video. Oh, hey, by the way, if you want to send your own horror stories, there's an email linked in the description. But even if you don't have any horror stories, in us like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.